So in terms of AI development, Cursor AI still holds the crown for me. I've tried the new version of VS Code. I've been using Windsurf, Bolt DIY, Replit. And these are all great tools, but I just find Cursor has the best of everything wrapped into one at the moment. And I'm going to cover it more in this uh, tutorial today. But the good news is everything that you learn through developing a web app or a mobile app or anything else with Cursor AI, the same principles work across these other tools. And all of these tools, the user interface is really styled based on VS Code, which is probably the most popular editor out there. So every time you move between each one, there's a lot of familiar familiarity in terms of how they're designed. So the great thing about Cursor is it'll help you build any kind of application, whether it's a web app, a mobile app, uh, you can even build games by plugging into Unity or Godot, or even, you know, plugging into ROS to develop robots or Python and working with Blender. You can pretty much do anything with Cursor AI. It's really versatile. So in this tutorial, we're going to step through an install. I'm going to take you through the setup and settings. We're going to talk about the agent and the composer, when to use either one. We're going to talk about tab and control K for individual file editing. And we're going to talk about AI dev best practices, all the kind of tips and tricks that I've learned over the last hundred plus hours of developing with Cursor uh, and how to make it go a hell of a lot faster. Typically, I'll start any development project by going to Claude, opening a project and using Sonnet 3.5 to input my high level idea of what it is I want to build. I'm always careful not to be too prescriptive in terms of the technologies I want to use. It's really interesting to see what Claude is going to suggest and what approach to take. So if you're interested in building things with AI, I highly recommend you check out Switch Dimension where I'm giving courses on how to build apps, agencies, businesses, all based around AI. And one course that's particularly interesting is the Build Anything with Cursor AI course. You can join the waitlist here and get preferred pricing. It's going to be launching in the new year. And if you get onto the waitlist here, just hit get in touch and uh, we'll get you on the preferred pricing list for the pre-launch before it goes live. Okay, back to the tutorial. Okay, so this is the Cursor AI editor. So in the left hand panel, we have, first of all, our file structure. So this is all the different files that we have in the current directory that we're working from. You can search through all your files through the entire project or just an individual page. We've got source control here, which basically means using Git or it can be attached to GitHub. What that means is every time you make some changes, you stage those changes. And then when you're happy, you commit those changes that indicates basically a point in time that you've saved the document and you can then decide to go back in time to previous versions of your code setup. And that's very powerful and really important when you're working with um, pair programming with AI. It can make big changes, particularly if you're using Composer or the Composer agent and you want to be able to step back in time if it gets out of control or makes too many edits that you didn't exactly want. So I advise that you're constantly committing, uh, staging. I, I advise that you constantly stage changes and commit as you run through a project. Also useful is the extensions. So basically you can install new extensions based on what kind of code base you're working with. Oftentimes you'll get recommendations from those as you start using them. And of course, Docker then if you want to containerize your local host development or put it up into the cloud, but that's kind of a bit out of the scope of this. So what Cursor is mostly known for is its tab ability. So if I hit return, I can actually, I'll see a suggestion is given to me here. And if I hit the tab button, it completes that out. I can also select a line and I can hit control K and then I can write new instructions for code that I want to enter here or I can have or I can highlight a line. I can hit control K and I can say explain this and instead of generating I can just go to a quick question to help me understand what's going on. So it's telling me it's an async function. This is just really good when you're making your way through the code and you don't exactly know what something is doing. You can use the ask question to help explain what's going on. You can also do things like highlight and then add that to the chat. So it'll add this to the chat window on the left hand side and we'll cover that in a second. So another great feature of cursor is in the terminal. If I hit 
control K, it can give me a list of command instructions. So you don't need to be a terminal wizard anymore. Any problems that you have that show up in the workspace. So let's say I've misnamed this here. You can actually click on this little button here and then it's actually giving me the suggestion to fix this, change the spelling to handle converts and then, or I can actually decide to fix with AI. So sometimes if it's very obvious, you'll get the fix will come here straight away. And if not, you can work with the AI to figure it out or you can just highlight this here. Now what's cool with issues is also you'll see on your file menu here that you'll get a hierarchy of the error down to the actual problem itself. So you'll see all the pages. So it's the page within poster, within app, within source. So even if this was all closed, you'd know exactly where that error was coming from. So that's really useful to know. The color schemes here are important. So on to the good stuff. So you can toggle this panel open here by this little button here, or you can hit control alt B. So think about chat as basically your way to have a conversation with the AI, but it doesn't necessarily go and implement any kind of changes that you want made. So you might make a suggestion and ask, Hey, I'm thinking about adding Superbase to the project. How would I go about do that? I'm having problem saving to Git. How would I do that? And it has the context for your project and it can save it in. What's important to do though, what's different from chat compose and composer is where you can and where you know it is add the context of the file that you're working on. So if you think about agents, they work on context, they have a certain amount of memory. You don't want to give them the entire code base every single time to search through, although they're getting better at that. You want to give the exact file that you think the problem is in or that you're asking about. So I might add in the root file, the utility file here, and then ask a question. So I could just go like this. I can also do things like hit at here, and then I can decide to add to ask it to search the web for current information. So if I want to add a Shad CN component and it's out of date, maybe I add at web so that it'll search to get the most up-to-date version. I can add the entire code base. Sometimes I'll do that when I'm not having a lot of success by adding individual files, it'll scan the whole code base. Notepads then are basically these little scratch pads. So I can add in custom instructions or um, thoughts that I have about how the project should work. It might be always use Radix UI components, and this might be specific to this particular project. It might not be something I want to have in the cursor settings files or the cursor rules files. That's what the notepad is for. I can also add in docs. So there's a lot of docs that, the, that are already um, added as standard, but there's new ones like uh, Superbase, Chad CN, Asternity that I've been using, and I will just have those indexed. So you just say add a new doc, you type in the name of where those docs are stored, and it'll go ahead and index those, give you the most current version. Um, you can also select what model you're using here. Currently, I work off 3.5 Sonnet. It's my favorite. It's just doing the best so far. That changes on a daily basis. And you can also drop in images. So if you've got a screenshot of your app output and there's something broken um, and or you want to actually upload a design that you'd like to copy, you can add the image in here. Now over here, you've got two different options. You've got submit and you've got code base. So basically when you're hitting code base, it goes and does a quick index of the code base to see what context and what information it needs to pull through. If I'm not having a lot of joy with the individual file files, I'll use the code base button, which is control return. So that's basically the chat window. Oftentimes it'll make suggestions. And then when you have those suggestions, you just hit apply to page. So it might say, it might make a suggestion about a file and then I could just go and apply to the particular page and you'll see the changes are actually made here. And sometimes it'll give me a terminal command that it wants to run and I'll see the run button here. What it does is it opens up its own terminal and then runs that command. So that's really handy. So moving over to the composer. So the composer is probably the most powerful feature of cursor. So what's different about the chat window and the composer window is composer actually, once you give it some instructions, it goes to work. 
and it doesn't just go to work on one file, it goes across your entire code base. So oftentimes when you're adding a new feature, it's not just on one page. So you might have a subcomponent that you need to create that's part of a larger parent component and that might be part of a page. And then I also might need to upload the global.css or something else like that. There's a lot of work in doing that. The great thing about Composer is has all the context and it will make all those changes. So you went, whenever you run Composer, it goes through everything and all you have to do is hit the accept all button at the bottom and you'll see all the files that it has made changes to. So let's take a recent one here. It goes through and makes all these changes and then I can hit accept. And then if I, when I hit accept, it basically saves. And if I look at uh, my running application, I can actually see the full finished version. So Composer has two different options available. You have the normal setting and then you have the agent setting. So the agent setting is kind of one that you might want to start off using, see how you go. And then when you need more control, switch over to normal. It normally kind of works in that hierarchy. You start using the agent, it makes big sweeping changes, it fixes bugs, does all that kind of thing. It's kind of like very hands off. Um, it's my favorite, but you know, when you run into errors, switch over to normal, and then you've more control over each one of the iterations that it steps through. And then down from that, then again, you're just working with chat and asking individual questions of the code. And then a step down from that then is actually using the tab or actually using control K and asking it to make specific change to functions. So that's the hierarchy, really. You're starting with the agent, then composer, then the chat window, then control K, and then just tab down as far as writing code. And to be honest, I don't write code. I'm pretty much past that at the moment. I'm just basically prompting things into existence, error checking, and then working on the architecture and things like that. So there's also this new feature called uh, bug finder. And basically it's an experimental feature and the costs are really quite high at the moment. Essentially it compares your uncommitted changes or your current branch to the default or main branch. So if you're working on a feature branch, it'll check everything for errors there before you commit. So that's really quite powerful. So your cursor rules file, if you choose to set one up, you can also set your cursor rules in settings, but typically if you've got different projects, it can be good to have cursor rules file. You can basically get that from a website called cursor directory. You can download um, a, a set cursor rules files based on whatever you're working with. In this case, it's Next.js. So as you're developing, you might notice a quirk in how it works. You would just add in a new line to say, oh, you know, in future, let's be less verbose. Or I might say, you know, when I'm writing commit messages, let's be less verbose there. I don't need as many lines and add in whatever extra detail that you might want to have. So the cursor rules is very handy. You can go to the settings here just to make sure that it's um, uh, set up to be engaged. You can also write in your own settings here. So if these are to be applied across all your projects, you can add in your rules here. In the model section, you can decide on what models that are available. You can actually put in your own OpenAI key or your Anthropic key. I actually pay for Cursor. I'm paying $20 um, a month. I think it's really 100% worth it. I don't tell them I'd happily pay a lot more for the amount of productivity I get from it. So one of the things that Cursor is doing that's really nailing how well it works is the indexing of your code base. This should happen automatically, but in the case of the dozens, you can come here to settings and hit your uh, code base indexing. Okay, cool. So for example, here, I'm going to add in the context of a page I'm working on. I'm going to set it to agent. Let's add in options for X. LinkedIn, TikTok, and threads on the poster page. I've agent selected here, and then I'm going to hit submit. So it's helping me step through. It started to do some generation. I can see here the pages that it's working on here. And now you can see in the actual page, it's starting to apply all the changes. So what we see here in green is any change that's been made. In red are the changes that 
it wants to remove. And then by hitting Control Shift and Y here, or just clicking this, it accepts whatever that change is. So I don't actually have to individually go through each one of those changes when I'm using the agent. It's actually just going to make those for me if I hit accept. But what I want you to do is basically read down through the changes to understand what's going on at a high level. One thing that's also important to note when it is making changes is these little checkpoints here. So if you don't like exactly what it's done, you can actually hit the restore button here and it will take you back to that point in time. So I can go right back to here before I decided to ask it to make any changes. So that's really powerful. The other thing that you need to be doing all the time is staging your changes. So that's basically collecting all the changes that you've made together and then committing. And that actually commits and saves to your Git hub to your Git repository. So at any given point in time, you can use the checkpoint system here to go back in time, or you can use one of these commit points to go back to if you want to go back even further. So when working with AI, it's really important to constantly be using checkpoints and also to be staging changes because the power of how fast it moves, it can make big changes quickly but it can actually do it in a way that you know disrupts or breaks your code. So you want to be able to step back in time and then step through carefully what exactly those changes were. Another tip I would have is to use popular frameworks and languages in your development. And the reason for that is if you think about how large language models work, they work on crawling and pulling in all the information and knowledge from the internet. The more examples it has, the more corpus, the more stack overflow answers it has, the better it's going to be. So for front end web development, I typically default to Next.js. It's a really huge community. It's well supported and there's a ton of um, support for it in terms of the language models. Shad CNUI is a great component library and it's really well supported. And uh, components are basically all these little widgets and tools that you have on your website, like a drop down, an input box. Uh, they've already been pre-created and allows you to move very quickly in terms of scaffolding. And the tools like V0 and others use ShadCN in creating their interfaces. So there's a lot of compatibility there. Tailwind is also really well supported now in the last couple of years. It's just a really useful and easy way for a developer to design and style a website. And oftentimes a lot of these frameworks will default to using that. So I recommend Tailwind. Then in terms of a database, um, anything really is well supported by Cursor. You can use Superbase, Firebase, MongoDB, any kind of Postgres database that you can think of. So hopefully you found that useful. It was really a brain dump of all my learning over the last 100 hours or so of using Cursor AI. I'm building a course around AI development where I'm basically teaching you how to build AI by using AI tools like V0, Cursor, uh, Windsurf, everything that you could possibly use to speed yourself along in the process of building a business, an agent, a web app, anything that you could possibly think of. So if you're into that kind of thing, please jump over to switchdimension.com. Can't wait to see you guys in the new year. And if I don't see you before that, have a great holiday.